Ross, I'll come to you first on hydrogen. Is it a goer? Is it a viable baseload alternative? Look, to make hydrogen, you need uh, electricity and you need lots of cheap electricity, and that's something Australia does not have in spades right now. Three forms of hydrogen. Uh, there's what's called brown hydrogen currently produced, which is relatively cheap, but it involves basically cracking um, hydrocarbons, coal or natural gas, uh, to create it. Um, it's cheap, but it does emit carbon dioxide. The second way is what's called blue hydrogen. Uh, this is more expensive, but effectively what you do is capture that carbon dioxide dioxide and store it somewhere, generally underground. The third form is green hydrogen. This is the one that everybody wants. And this is by using either solar or wind energy, cracking that uh, water in this case to create either hydrogen or oxygen. That's what they're after. They say it could be worth $11 billion per year. But just for some context, liquefied natural gas right now contributes $30 billion a year to Australia's economy. Iron ore produces some $55 billion a year to the Australian economy. So even at its best, it's still not going to be matching the current big contributors to Australia's economy. That was a great bit of analysis. Nice and simple for us all there. Thank you, Ross. I want to go to you, Terry, on, uh, on the headcount around Canberra. When I went through the budget papers and I looked at uh, the growth in the public service numbers and salaries, I thought I had the full story. Uh, but statistics out today, and these are damning statistics inside defence, that we've got more contractors in defence, 32,000, than we have military personnel. 31,000. And the cost of these contractors, so they don't look like they're public servants, it keeps them off the books, but it's $1.5 billion. Now, I honestly, Terry, I am shocked by that and I can't imagine taxpayers tonight watching the show would think it's a good idea either. Uh, before I get to that, Peter, can I just add a very brief comment on the hydrogen matter? To me, it's a very simple thing. It's the latest climate change boondoggle which joins all the other boondoggles where we try to produce energy rather than actually get it from the way we can do it sensibly. But on the defence issue, yes, I mean, this is the reality of government, as we know from, from day one, that whenever you build government into, into anything, the first thing you build is bureaucracies. Uh, a, and then B, you find ways of avoiding the, the stark reality of the numbers. So you don't call them employees, you call them contractors. And again, it's coming spinner, who can make some money at the at the taxpayer teat? And the reality is that we have an armed forces, as you say, where most of the money is spent not on actually defending the country, but on but on the, the bureaucracy that surrounds it. And it's appalling. Uh, I would hope that Peter Dutton, who's already shown a, a great start in terms of addressing all the woke reality that was was infecting our armed forces, I would hope that he follows through uh, in this space as well. Yeah, just quickly though, it's worse than that because there's the Defence Uniform Brigade, 31,000. There's the yeah. contractors, 32,000. Then there's all the Defence paid public servants. So you add those two together and the poor old guy wearing the uniform or woman in the uniform are absolutely the much smaller cohort. Uh, Ross, I want to go to another issue out there today. I, I picked it up about the National Australia Bank, accusations that they've underpaid staff, hundreds of millions of dollars again, according to the Financial Services Union. They're going to go to the, the federal court, they say, the union. But, but why is it that NAB's under this uh, cloud? We have the CBA do the same thing. All these really big companies, you'd presume they'd have a sophisticated payroll system and they've all got HR departments. How can they get paying their staff so wrong? I think it comes down to one very basic thing, and that is Australia's industrial relations systems and awards, all these types of things, are just so complicated that it doesn't matter whether you're running a big business or a small business, that it is almost impossible to get this right. And oddly enough, the umpire, which is a Fair Work Commission, gives you no assistance pretty much whatsoever. It's only when the Fair Work Ombudsman or unions come knocking on your door and they start to do audits going back over the years that you realise that you've got the 
these things wrong, notwithstanding probably uh, the best intent of the employers in most cases to get these things right. And so ultimately they actually have to pay up this money um, to, to recompense uh, the rights that have been done. But ultimately is not necessarily the intent of the employer that is wrong. It is actually the complication of the system, which is the reason why Australia's industrial relations system needs to be overhauled. Although there's no political will to do that either right now. <laughs> Absolutely no political. Will they pull the legislation if they fear they're going to have to have to have a stoush in the Senate? Uh, Terry, I've got to go to this uh, blackout in Queensland the other day. Half a million odd, 477,000 homes lost power, businesses lost power, multiple explosions at that power plant near Biloela. Let's put aside what caused it, but, but Matt Canavan made the point yesterday that even during the blackout, even following the failure of a coal-fired power station, solar and hydro was just 7% of Queensland's power. This just shows the devastation, doesn't it, when we start to... In this case, it was a catastrophe, but when we're going to start permanently retiring these sites, this is what we've got to look forward to. Uh, just a correction, Peter, solar and wind, I think, in that case, not hydro. But uh, the reality is, yes, I mean, you, the basic problem, and we can't avoid it, is that if you don't spend the money on keeping these plants in fine, in good shape, this is the sort of outcome that you'll get very rarely. I can't remember when the last time we had a coal-fired power station blowing up in the way that this one did, but it's it's a, it's a no-brainer. I mean, you coal-fired power, gas-fired power, real power stations, nuclear power stations can be used all the time. You can't call on wind and solar when you need them if if other forms of power generation are running into difficulty. So it's it's, it's basically, as, as Matt Canavan said, a, 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 a pointer to where we're heading in, into this future where we end up, hopefully, in, in, the, in the mad green world, that we'll get over 100% of our power from, from renew, so-called renewable sources. Oh. Yeah, it's crazy. And you look at the budget and you wonder where the money's going to come from. Terry McCran, Ross Greenwood, thank you for your time.